Okay, uh, hello everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the OFI workshop on fisheries management reference points in highly dynamic ecosystems. My name is Fan Jia and I'm a research scientist at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Also one of the three members of the steering committee of the workshop. The other two members are my colleague Tyler Eddy from also from Memorial University and Daniel Duplessis from Fisheries and, and Oceans Canada. This workshop is funded by an Ocean Frontier Institute through an award from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. Please note, this workshop will be recorded and the keynote presentations will be made available online for later viewing. We will also record the question and answer as well as discussions, uh, but just for the purpose of note keeping, which will not be posted online. However, uh, if any participants do not want their questions or discussions to be recorded at all, please send an email to the steering committee within the next 15 minutes. Uh, if we receive any objections, we will not record the Q&A and discussion for this workshop. Um, in the beginning of the workshop, we would like Dan to make the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Fan. Uh, so uh, I am located in the Lower St. Lawrence region of Quebec in Canada, and I'd like to make the acknowledgement of this area as the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq and the Wallis-Degwe people. The OFI meeting is uh, centered out of Memorial, uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada, and this is the ancestral home of the Baotic and the Mi'kmaq people. We'd also like to acknowledge the Inuit and the Innu as the original people of Labrador. And participants from this meeting, in this meeting, come from many different locations from Canada and from the United States in the East and the West and in the center of the continent. And as well, we have international participants, for instance, from New Zealand. And we'd like to recognize that most of us are located on the traditional territories of displaced indigenous peoples. These territories include not only the lands on which we live, but also the waters. These waters have provided sustenance for Indigenous peoples and they sustain us all right now. And this is what brings us together in this workshop. That is so that we can understand how we can become better caretakers of these resources, using them both productively and sustainably. And this pays honor to the past and to the present. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tyler Eddy at uh, Memorial University, and I'm just going to spend a couple slides um, introducing the Ocean Frontier Institute, as well as the uh, center that is hosting the workshop at Memorial. Um, so many of you have probably heard of uh, the Ocean Frontier Institute, also referred to as OFI. Uh, this was established in 2016, and it's a partnership between Dalhousie University, Memorial University, and the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, OFI has an ocean research focus on examining key aspects of atmosphere-ocean interactions, including the resulting ocean dynamics and shifting ecosystems, as well as focusing on solutions um, such as effective approaches to resource development that are sustainable, globally competitive, societally acceptable, and resilient to change. And this workshop is being funded under the Research Module H, which is the Sustainable Capture Fisheries and Their Ecosystems module um, to develop uh, computer models for assessing fish stocks, to assess the health and productivity of ocean ecosystems under climate change, and to develop innovative harvesting technologies. So the group that uh, Fan and I both uh, are part of is called the Center for Fisheries Ecosystems Research, also referred to as CIFR. This is based at the Marine Institute uh, within the Mor Memorial University of Newfoundland. Um, so a little bit about us in case you're not uh, familiar with our group. Um, we grant master's and PhD degrees in fishery science. Um, at the moment, we don't have a bachelor program in fishery science. Uh, we're a relatively new group uh, formed in 2010 with support from the Newfoundland and Labrador provincial government. Uh, our present staff, we have uh, a director, eight research scientists, uh, three postdocs, 
21 grad students, five technical staff, uh, and we continue to grow. Our mandate is to focus research on Newfoundland and Labrador fisheries and the sustainability of stocks. We offer research and training opportunities to grad students, both locally and internationally. Uh, we collaborate with DFO, such as activities like this, um, as well as for fisheries management. And we collaborate with other researchers and institutions, as well as industry within Canada and worldwide. So within our group, um, there's a number of uh, scientists who uh, specialize in stock assessment, such as Noel Cadigan, Fan Zhang, who's here with you today, and Jin Gao, who's also here with you today. And I think Noel's also here as well. Um, we have some individuals who focus on fisheries ecology and habitat, uh, Sherry Lynn Rowe, Arnaud Labrie, uh, Jonathan Fisher, um, Maxime Geoffroy does a lot of work in the Arctic, uh, looking uh, at Arctic ecosystems and acoustics. And I'm the most recent addition to the team and uh, my background is in ecosystem modeling and climate change. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, so the motivation of this workshop actually is, originates from some regional concerns. Uh, in Newfoundland region, we have been seeing that some systematic and persistent changes of multiple fish populations uh, for several important fisheries. Uh, probably uh, the best well-known example is the collapse of the northern cod in the early 1990s. And uh, despite of the prolonged mor fisheries moratorium still in a pretty low abundance uh, in the recent decades. So this actually generated some discussions and concerns among industry and management about uh, whether the ecosystem has entered a new regime or like a new, like a, a, a new environmental regime. And uh, if that is the case, uh, maybe the traditional, the traditional ways to identify management reference points could not be appropriate. And we may need some new ways to identify reference points and develop management strategies. So then we reach out to our DFO colleagues across Canada and it turns out this issue is not a unique in Newfoundland region. Actually, it has been identified uh, in multiple fisheries across Canada. And we have received interest from several DFO scientists who are looking for guidance and advice. And when we further expand our scope to uh, other areas, it, it actually it really turns out this is a pretty widespread phenomenon globally. Like a few months ago, we had a ISIS workshop on similar topic, and there has been several initiatives in the US on this topic as well. Uh, and the fact this workshop attracted uh, uh, around 100 participants from you know, Canada, US, uh, Europe, uh, New Zealand, and Australia really is another proof that this is really a very urgent and uh, you know, important issue globally. So then we decided to do this workshop uh, with three objectives. Um, so the first objective is to discuss whether we need to consider changing management reference points. This may seem to be a trivial question. However, it actually reflect, it reflect some conceptual change of fisheries management, which is changing from a single equilibrium assumption to what we call a multiple states assumption. And this could have, have very dramatic implications to our definitions of fishery status. For example, some previously defined as healthy stock may turn out to be endangered under a different standard and vice versa. Uh, the second objective is to discuss when we should change management reference points. What are the qualitative and the quantitative evidence that needed to trigger the change? And what are the methodologies to test for such evidence. And the, uh, finally, we want to discuss how to change management reference points. So what are the available methodologies to implement the change and what are the caveats and the limitations of these methodologies? So for this workshop, we have two parts. Part one is the online workshop this week, uh, which features the format of keynote talks plus Q&A plus general discussions. And uh, there is another component, which is an in-person workshop in the future. 
and we hope in the end of this online workshop, we can get some feedback and suggestions on how we can proceed to the in-person workshop in the future. The date of the in-person one is ED, depending on the uh, future of the pandemic and the travel restrictions. And the location will be here at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and the format, the format of the in-person one will be like a more traditional one with presentations plus panel discussions, plus breakout groups and plus networking. So for, the, uh, for this week's online workshop, we have five days. Uh, for day one, we will feature a keynote talk by Dr. Andre Pont from University of Washington. Day two, we have Dr. Anna Rindolf from Technical University of Denmark. Day three, we have Dr. Jason Link from NOAA. And day four, we have Dr. Robin Forrest from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. In the final day, we will present some preliminary results of the survey analysis and as well as a panel discussion with the keynote speakers. So before the workshop, we have invited all participants to fill in a survey. Uh, if you haven't done so, please do this ASAP so we can include your answers to the analysis uh, to present in the final day. Uh, throughout this workshop, we want participants to keep in mind and uh, thinking a few questions, which may help the uh, to help to guide, uh, guide the discussion. So uh, they are like, first one will be how commonly are dynamic reference points used in practice? Uh, which methods are used to establish dynamic reference points? Which fisheries have, be, have they been applied to? And when should the dynamic reference points to, to be applied? What are the barriers to applying dynamic reference points? Uh, we will post these uh, questions into the chat window for people to view uh, throughout the workshop. Uh, now I will turn the mic to Dan to moderate today's workshop. Okay, thanks uh, Fan and Tyler. Uh, so just a little, uh, I guess, code of conduct or how we're going to conduct this. Um, please keep your mic uh, muted and camera off during the presentations. Uh, we will only take uh, questions at the end of the presentation as opposed to during. And if you have a question or a comment, uh, please type something into the chat, chat such as question or comment. At that point, uh, we'll take a list of the order of which people have, have asked questions, which is why we've done it in the chat and not with the raised hands. And we would ask you at, when you're called upon to unmute your mic and open your camera and uh, state your name, your, your full name, as well as your affiliation and ask your question. Um, we'd ask you to try to keep your questions succinct with um, only as much preamble as required to understand the question. And if time permits, and we think it will, um, we'll open the floor to general comments and questions. But also we ask you to, if things come along in your, pop up in your head as you go along, particularly pertaining to the five questions that were just posted in the chat, um, keep that for the final day. Uh, and these are the these are sort of the key questions that should help orient the discussion on the final day. You'll see at the end of this slide, and this is available on the on the Google Drive link, which you will also be posted and in, in the chat uh, right there, uh, that you will have access to this presentation as well as to the keynote speakers' presentations, and we will also be drafting the report in that. So now let's get on to the to the real crux of what we're here for. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Andre Punt. Uh, Dr. Punt is a professor, a professor at the University of Washington and a world-renowned expert in fish stock assessment, fisheries management, and just about everything. And we probably, everybody on this call has come across Andre Punt's work in one way or another. His lab uh, has had many people going through it and he's used a variety of uh, techniques, uh, usually very quantitative, uh, Bayesian methods, maximum likelihood methods. He's done uh, bioeconomic models, uh, management strategy evaluation, ecosystem and uh, multi-species models within his lab. Uh, his research touches pretty well uh, all labs around the world and he's made a particular impact in uh, the US, in Australia and how they conduct their fishery science work, but uh, in general. 
and he's also um, had a, a strong impact on international fisheries management organizations such as well, I, RFMOs, but uh, the International Whaling Commission, he's been involved in ICES in various ways. And uh, so uh, Andre is a fitting person to give us our first talk today, uh, looking in the rear view mirror, uh, 35 years of evolving uh, thoughts on time bearing productivities, and he's going to do it in 45 minutes. Uh, so I will stop sharing my screen and pass this over to you, Andre, so you can share yours. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, looks like we've got that working. Uh, firstly, thanks to everyone for inviting me. Um, I, I have a funny feeling that age before expertise came to the fore here. Um, like most of us, I've been thinking about this issue for a long time. And when I was invited to give this presentation, I realized that um, I looked a little different when I started thinking about this. This is actually a picture of me in 1995. Um, and I believe the first time I invoked a changing reference point was 1996. So, um, a pretty close approximation to, to what's happened to me over the, four, the 35 years since uh, I first uh, had to confront this issue head on. Um, and uh, it was challenging then, they, you know, changing a reference point, or more correctly, changing the way we think about setting reference points um, is and will always be politically uh, pretty tenuous and, and challenging. So. Uh, before I get into the actual presentation, I'd like to thank uh, Kristen Privatera Johnson, one of my grad students who may or may not be on the call with 92 people. It's hard to notice that. Um, and she, 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 her, the thesis, the focus for one of the fo focus foci, foci for her thesis will be uh, changing reference points and regime shifts. So, uh, highly pertinent. Um, I'd also like to put this in the context of. Um, a lot of what you're going to see is not my work, um, and I think I saw Cody Suswalski on the call. Cody's work will be in here. Uh, there are numerous people who I have plagiarized and probably got wrong, um, and maybe we can pick that up in the questions. Um, and the other caveat that I'm going to pick up on um, is that uh, I'll be focusing on model-based approaches. Um, the, you know, a, a lot of the recent work in fisheries management is how to deal with data poor species. Um, and uh, to be honest, at this point, we really haven't thought too deeply about how do we deal with changing environment when you don't even know virtually anything about a stock. So this is very much focused on those cases where we are uh, quote unquote data rich. Um, or to quote um, Jimmy Anelli, who I don't think is also on this call, there is no such thing as a data-rich stock. Every stock needs more data. Um, so I'm going to just start um, my presentation by some axioms um, that I'm going to work by. Um, and the first one is that um, reference points themselves, uh, by definition, are estimates of things. Um, and like all estimates and all models, they are by definition going to be wrong all of the time to some extent. Um, and so um, the context of where I'm coming from is not that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater, although I've certainly heard that mentioned, uh, but that rather we should do the best that we can given the data that we have available to us. Um, and, and to put this further in context, um, there are two main areas where I see reference points coming in uh, and I will almost randomly move between the two applications. The first is um, use in harvest control rules, which I suspect is the um, focus area for the workshop, at least the, the motiv original motivation for it, uh, but also uh, when we're using management strategy evaluation to compare alternative strategies, uh, we also need to think about what we mean by reference points, in particular in the context of are we achieving our goals? And um, a further sort of axiom that I'm going to pivot my talk around is the notion of bias and variance. Um, and, and at the end of the day, much of the debate in the literature is all about bias and variance. Um, bias in the sense that we are using uh, an expected value of a reference point that is wrong um, and that we need to be fixed, um, that's bad. 
Uh, but at the same time, um, and uh, it was raised in the in the uh, intro, is that we also have imprecision. So um, it's sort of like, uh, what is the worst thing you can do? Not change your reference points when you should, or change your reference points when you shouldn't. So we'll be talking about bias and we'll be talking about variance. So what do I um, mean uh, by changing reference points? And here I'm introducing the concept of stationarity. Um, and stationarity tends to be talked about in the context primarily of stock truth relationships. Uh, but as I hope I'll point out, at least in some of the examples, stationarity uh, impacts other biological parameters such as growth and, and natural mortality. So, um, you know, what is the dictionary definition of stationarity? Standing still, not moving. Well, that's pretty boring. Uh, the one we care about, uh, and from a statistical point of view, is uh, if we have a system that is stationary, and we observe that system at two points in time, uh, a priori, we should not know uh, which of where, which data point came first. So basically there's no change in the mean or in fact in the variance of the process. Um, and that is a nice easy definition, uh, but one it's to apply it is of course the challenge. And just to, uh, for those of a more grammatical persuasion, uh, I will not be talking about your filing system today. Uh, we are not talking about stationary, we're talking about stationary. So, um, Stationarity has been the cornerstone of much of our fisheries management practices literally for decades. Um, and the reason for that is simply uh, that we, most of our management systems are based on passive adaptive management. We, we assume that by collecting more information, we will get more precise estimates. Um, and hopefully you can see my mouse uh, vaguely. Um, is a very, very small, if I was smart enough, I'd change the size of the mouse, but I'm not, so I won't. Um, so we've, this is actually from a, a recent paper uh, looking at estimation performance. Um, and what each of these lines are, are uh, simulation intervals. And you think of them as confidence intervals, they're not quite confidence intervals, but simulation intervals as we add more data. So in this particular case, there's a model that is unbiased, we like that. Um, uh, you have to use your imagination a little bit to extrapolate these intervals out, but as you can see, as we move forward, uh, we gain more information, become more precise about the estimates of these two quantities. Um, an important thing to note um, is that uh, passive adaptive management uh, ain't a great thing when your model is wrong. So this is actually on the, on the lower panels, this is a case where I have a model misspecification, um, and in fact, in this case, I think it's time varying uh, natural mortality. Um, and I ignore that when I fit the model. Um, and you can see that uh, while something is going on, uh, there's obviously bias and uh, the benefits of passive adaptive management have sort of been lost. Um, and, and that really is the crux of the matter that we're trying to address. So what we wanna do is we want to base our reference points, particularly on a time period where uh, passive adaptive management works in our favor. Now, um, as I say, we've known for a very long time that uh, ecological systems vary um, over time. Uh, I, I thought I saw Carrie Holt on this call. This may actually be a paper, a, 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 a take from one of her papers or certainly from the lab she came from. Uh, these are uh, estimates of the Ricker slope parameter for, uh, I believe, sockeye salmon, but I may be wrong. Um, and the key point here is that um, for some stocks, at least, there is considerable variation in, in that parameter. Um, and most people working on salmon uh, would uh, almost laugh at us ground fish type people who sort of live in the world of uh, stationarity. Um, this, is, this is sort of a given in, in, the, in the salmon world. Um, and of course, these are extraordinarily informative data sets. That's not, let, let's be a little fairer to the rest of us and, and talk about um, a, a Telios now. This is Pollock, uh, Bering Sea Pollock, uh, not generally regarded as a data poor species, but nevertheless, uh, not quite a salmon either. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in the detail here, 
But what this is, what the plot of is uh, changes in weighted age over time. Um, and of course, weighted age uh, can be measured, unlike, dare I say, the slope of the stock root relationship. Um, and it can be very influential in terms of uh, some of our reference points. Um, so for example, uh, F max or FMSY will change depending on mean weighted age. Uh, in the context of Pollock, I don't have the numbers here, but when Jimmy and Eddie gave a talk recently on, um, on the stock assessment for the species, uh, the quota, if you want to use the non-US terminology, uh, was very sensitive to assumptions about weighted age going into the future. So uh, when we're thinking about time varying uh, reference points or time varying biology, uh, we need to think a little beyond uh, what the literature is really focused on uh, to include uh, these other biological parameters. Um, Think, you know, is this important? Well, it depends. Um, this is actually a, a modeling study, the results of modeling study uh, for uh, red king crab in the Bering Sea. It's actually something I did do rather than all the things I stole from other people. Um, so this is a region where um, uh, pH changes are predicted to occur over the next 100 years. So we're talking about a, a, a long-term strategic analysis here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but this uh, plot at the top here, this is actually predicted expected larval survival um, as a function of time expressed relative to 2000, so 2000 is a reference value. Um, and what I really want to show you here uh, are two plots. Uh, firstly, the, this one down here, uh, this indicates essentially the maximum sustainable yield over time as a function, um, a derived function of, of ocean pH implicitly uh, through, through year and through larval survival. And you can see there's some dramatic effects on, on MSY. Um, this is a yield curve. These are all yield curves for that matter. Uh, here is MSY and BMSY. And this is a locus of points of BMSY and MSY uh, following time. So you can think of this highest uh, yield function as being the present, um, and this trajectory being the trajectory over time of our yield function. So if you look at that plot, it will tell you two things. One is that MSY is going down. We sort of know, knew that from the first plot, but so is our equilibrium. Even under zero exploitation, we're likely to equilibrate, uh, if we believe that term, at a different point. So having pointed to the the, the background and the context, I'm going to ask four questions, uh, which probably should have been the five questions that are actually the focus of this workshop, but I didn't know them. Um, so the first one is, is very simple. Uh, should reference points be modified in response to changes to biological parameters? Uh, why do we want to do that? We want to reduce bias, achieve and better achieve our management goals. Um, and obviously, I'm going to talk about how we might test that. Uh, when, uh, I guess this is probably the biggest challenge for most of us, is not uh, do we think that reference points should be changed? I think most of us would say yes, uh, because we know biological systems are changing, but when do you make the call? And, and perhaps within the context of Canada and other jurisdictions, who makes the call? Um, and then finally, I am going to talk about methods for um, changing reference points, and there's, there's a there's a uh, a large number of them that have been tried out uh, and applied to, to varying degrees. So before I get into methods, I do want to talk about environmental drivers, um, and all of them are pertinent to, to reference points. Um, so the top panel just shows a random sequence, a set of random numbers. I think they might be autocorrelated, I can't remember. Um, this is probably what we see in, in almost all biological parameters, that there is some form of time variation. Um, uh, in some sense, perhaps passive adaptive management can handle this kind of thing, depending on how extreme things are. Um, the one that's received the most attention in the literature are regime changes in parameters. So for example, um, if, uh, if this was something like mean recruitment, um, and I'll touch on a paper that's looked at some of this, um, you know, what do we do if we see these large-scale changes in uh, regimes? 
And before I get too far down this road, I do want to introduce one of the nasty challenges of, um, of the problem we're facing, and that is not that there is a regime here, but how would we detect that we've changed regimes? Now, in this particular example, it's a little naive, everything is beautiful, uh, but uh, in a normal, uh, poorly monitored system, uh, is it plausible that by the time we've detected the regime has changed, it has changed again? Um, that's a very real uh, possibility if your regime itself is quite short, which I'll show you in a moment is not uncommon. Um, and then the real nasty, which is uh, the example of which I gave for, um, for Crab, is the, uh, the trend case where the, some parameter is changing in a, in a, in a, a long, uh, consistent way. Um, so I'm not going to go through this uh, slide. This is actually a summary by a paper by Cody Suzwalski. Uh, looking at uh, how often we see trends in uh, stock and recruitment information. Um, and you'll notice there's a column here uh, that indicates uh, stocks with shifts. Uh, these are uh, stocks that have got shifts in recruitment, uh, average recruitment. Uh, and you'll notice that there are a large number of those stocks. It's about 50%, I think, and, and Cody will remember um, better than I would. Um, and the other thing is how long some of these regimes are. They're actually quite short, so you can retrospectively detect them, but it will be challenging to prospectively uh, test them in most cases. Um, so, um, do you know? Is this just a problem that um, uh, that you face in Eastern Canada? The answer, and I think we heard it already, is no. Uh, almost every ecosystem has had some level of uh, change in average recruitment. This again is from the paper by Cody, um, and I'm hoping Cody is going to type in the corrections to, to what I've said here. Uh, but essentially, what you're looking at in these bar charts uh, are uh, when we're seeing uh, estimated um, uh, regime shifts. So, uh, plenty of evidence that these things happen. Um, obviously, I would say it is very unlikely that anyone changed management regime or management reference points in a major way uh, at each of these time periods. So, um, you know, how do we, what do, how do we actually reflect um, stationarity or changes in stationarity in management decision making? So before I get into this section, I, I want to make an analogy uh, with an oft stated uh, assumption. So I'm sure all of you have been in meetings where someone has said, um, there is no stock crude relationship. And uh, usually that then is followed by, we will assume mean recruitment. I want to make the point that that is one of the strongest assumptions that we could possibly make as assessment scientists. So the message I'm trying to give here is not that you shouldn't assume recruitment is constant. That's a pretty good estimation assumption, uh, but rather that making no assumption is in fact an assumption. So uh, if your management system defaults uh, to uh, assume stationarity until you prove otherwise, um, you are rather like the now unemployed uh, assessment scientist that once told me, um, uh, I looked at the CPUE series, it was going down, uh, but it wasn't yet significant at the 95% level, so I will assume that there is no change in abundance, okay? If you are that person, I haven't looked at everyone on the list, it's probably time to rethink your career again. So um, the, the default assumption of no change is something that you need to recognize that you are uh, you're making. Um, I'm sure you've all looked at this plot already. Uh, there are not, these are just the standard kinked control rule. Number of parameters on this model, each and every single one of these could and probably is time varying. So um, before we um, go too far, I'm gonna delve a little bit into US policy. US policy through the, the Magnuson Act, um, I'm sure I'm looking, Aaron Berger works for NOAA, so he, he probably Works, wakes up in the morning and recites the, the Magnuson Act. I don't do that. I believe this is in the uh, national uh, guidelines for applying the national standards, but I may be wrong. Um, and I've highlighted a, a phrase, um, and that really helps uh, me and similar people in the US uh, decide 
uh, how to set our, our reference point. So uh, the definition of MSY is that uh, it's the largest long-term average catch that can be taken from a stock or stock complex, would you believe it's written by lawyers, uh, under prevailing ecological or environmental conditions. And, and that really is the key phrase for what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. What do we mean by under prevailing ecological or environmental conditions? And uh, they've been interpreted in a lot of different ways. So um, perhaps the, uh, the poster child of how we can change reference points over time uh, is Pacific Sardine off the US West Coast and, and Mexico and Canada for that matter. Well, not of Canada right now, but in principle one day again, maybe 30, 40 years time. Um, and this is a, a, a stock where the control rule uh, explicitly includes the environment. Now, I'll, I'll touch a little bit more on why that is in, in one of the later slides, but normally we're used to a plot of a control rule where you've got biomass on the x-axis and a quota on the y-axis and there's a line. Uh, this thing is a three-dimensional plot, um, and the reason that is is that FMSY, and hence the quota, depends on temperature as well as biomass. So this is a system where changing reference points are absolutely integrated into the management system. Uh, that's pretty unusual. Most of the time people make um, uh, decisions as to whether you're uh, in a new regime or, or whatever. This system is trying to integrate that process uh, explicitly into the harvest control rule. So uh, essentially in principle, every year we're changing the reference points and we're changing them in a formulaic way. A more conventional, uh, although still um, uh, can be co uh, controversial way, uh, essentially is to do breakpoint analyses. So this is uh, an example for some crabs in the Bering Sea. Um, this is a paper uh, by myself. I believe Cody was a co-author of this one as well. Um, so uh, what we're seeing here, this is recruitment for Bristol Bay Red King Crab and for Tanner Crab. Uh, what I did was I did a, uh, a two, uh, a breakpoint analysis. Uh, this is AIC here. Uh, it turns out that 1984 was a, was a year for breakpoints. Um, but I think one of the things about a plot like this is you'll often, if you, if you apply this kind of method to data, you will find a breakpoint. The question is, is it a meaningful breakpoint? And one of the reasons why we're fairly comfortable with these breakpoints, and you'll notice they're approximately in the same place for the two stocks, is this corresponds to the 1977 regime shift in the North Pacific. So here is a case where we've got a change in model output, uh, but that is related to um, something that a priori we might expect to see uh, cause a change in something like average recruitment. So um, bringing in the idea of statistical hypothesis testing along with uh, essentially bio using broader biological knowledge, something I will come back to later on. Before I go too far, um, uh, just throw out that, uh, you know, changing reference points are not going to solve all your problems. If your problem is why is my stock doing something I didn't expect, um, this is actually uh, Pacific Sardine. Uh, the blue line is the assessment uh, done by, I think, Peter Kiriyama at the Southwest Center. Um, and the red line is uh, estimate of dynamic B0. Um, so um, I will leave you to think about what this means. Um, uh, this stock was declared overfished. Uh, I personally would have said this stock has been over environmental um, because fishing itself was clearly not the, the driver uh, of, um, of the system. This is actually a case where the stock was declared overfished based on a reference point that is uh, static. Uh, it's written into the management plan, even though the control rule for the stock allows for time variation. So an unusual um, feature. So I'm now going to delve a little bit deeper into uh, methods for detecting uh, changes in biological parameters a very quick um, review of the literature and methods. Uh, so the first one is the one that method that's obviously first uh, most often used, which is simply to ignore time varying parameters and pretend they don't exist. Uh, the second class uh, is essentially to use these methods which allow us to um, 
uh, uh, calculate reference points um, uh, under environment, uh, current environmental conditions. Um, and I've got this little plot down the bottom. I, I think I have this in probably half the talks I give these days. Um, and that is just to remind folks that what we are trying to find is the optimum decision, recognizing that uh, we're always going to make mistakes, either by applying too simple models or trying to estimate too many parameters, or in this case, too many regimes. So the three methods I'm going to talk about are um, uh, basing uh, when to change reference points on some sort of a uh, statistical method, on moving averages, uh, explicitly bringing time variation into the assessments, and then the famous dynamic B0 assess uh, approach, which I'm sure you've got papers on. So, um, you know, as I say, the most common situation uh, is really to ignore the problem, and for most assessments, that's what we've done. Um, so why do we do that? Well, often we can barely estimate average recruitment. If we can't estimate average recruitment, it's probably a really daft idea to try and allow for um, time variation in that parameter. Um, so what we're worried about there is extreme variability. So we just can't do it. Um, the other assumption is that uh, trying to follow um, changing uh, reference points is essentially following noise rather than signal. And the best thing to do is actually just let the data catch up with you. So use passive adaptive management. And then, and this is a very real situation, I'll touch on an example later, is simply that it's politically uh, in, uh, impossible to change the reference point. So how, what methods do we use? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'm sure this is in the background material. Um, so the STARS method essentially is a method looking at um, changes in means, whether those means are statistically significantly different over time. And again, this is a paper by um, Cody Suzwalski, uh, looking at snow crab recruitment, I think this was, was and you can see that um, statistically there's a change in the mean between these two regimes. Uh, and a thing we perhaps uh, could do that is, is, that is less uh, linked to uh, statistical hypothesis tests is essentially base our reference points on some sort of a moving window of our parameters. I said I would um, uh, focus on recruitment, but touch on some other biological parameters. Uh, I just want to raise this paper by Maya Kapoor, uh, who's been looking at uh, changes, um, uh, in this case, to, to changes in stock rather than in biological parameters, but by looking at how biological parameters change over time. And one of the things she's been looking at, um, uh, time and latitude, should I say, and one of the things she looked at was how did growth rates change over time? So a, a statistical approach to essentially come up with a regime uh, based on growth rather than a regime based on recruitment. Um, and we can use that to, to define a regime. Um, just getting a piece of co cup of coffee. So in the North Pacific, it's pretty common for us to choose regimes. Um, uh, usually our regime obviously ends in the current year. The question is when it starts. Um, and we've used this, uh, this change point analysis um, in various ways. This is actually applied to recruits for spawner. Um, uh, the results thankfully are very similar to those you get when you apply it to recruits. So essentially the black and red lines here are different regression lines put through the recruits for spawner data. Um, and uh, essentially you get a change in about 1977, or 1977 uh, spawning, uh, which appears in the model a little later. Um, a more um, sort of more controversial example uh, is Jackass Morong. I'm now moving to Southern Australia. Um, so when the, the, the assessment was done, uh, so this is, uh, a line at the, ref, the limit reference point, this is the target reference point. Um, here we have the stock trajectory, and depending on how you squint, you're either above or below the limit reference point, but uh, essentially this fishery would be closed. Uh, this was a case where they drew a conclusion that a regime shift had occurred in 1988. Um, and essentially what you're seeing here, if you can see my cursor in the top right panel, is it restarted the biomass trajectory. So the stock isn't at the reference point, it's below the reference point. MSY is lower, 
uh, but the stock is no longer overfished or in need of, well, it's need of some rebuilding, but not a lot of rebuilding. Um, and here is the data. Um, I'm sure Jake Rice is cringing because I know he is on the call. This is a classic type of situation you see where one regime has all the points over here and another regime has all the points over there. Uh, so all of our theories about well-designed experiments goes away. Um, and if they didn't go away, we wouldn't have a problem. Here is the fit and you can see there is a change in, the, the best estimate is a change in, in mean recruitment. Um, so that, um, uh, this can go further. Uh, one of those examples for the North Pacific crab, uh, when we applied these AIC changing um, regimes, uh, I actually did it over lunch. Uh, I was sitting, I thought, gee, you know, I've always wanted to do this. Um, and so I did a quick change point analysis. I uh, found that there was a change in mean recruitment, came back after lunch, said, hey, you need to change mean recruitment. And we rebuilt the stock uh, over lunch, basically, because suddenly, instead of being below the, li uh, the limit reference point, the stock was now above the target reference point. Needless to say, that did lead to some discussion. Um, uh, touching now back on Pacific sardine again. So this is a case where we explicitly integrate the environmental parameter into our harvest control rule. Um, these are the uh, recruits for spawners. Uh, actually, this is logged recruits, but um, same thing. You see, uh, this is recruits for spawner against SSB, uh, against uh, sea surface temperature, and you can see a relationship. It's statistical. Um, and we've translated that into a function where our EMSY or FMSY proxy uh, is a function of SST. Um, we actually only use this range here. We don't extrapolate beyond it. But um, you can see that uh, as a function of sea surface temperature, we're sort of automatically changing the um, the uh, limit, the, 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 the target reference point. And, and I'll note that this particular control rule was selected by um, by simulation by, by one of my grad students. Uh, it was a very long, tedious, painful process with the Pacific Council here on, on the West Coast. Um, I'm not going to talk much about multi-species models. We got some smart people on the call. Um, so uh, many of us have applied multi-species models. We think we're really good at that. Uh, one of the one of the challenges of multi-species models is uh, definition of, of uh, reference points. Uh, this is a paper I wrote with a postdoc of mine. Uh, each of those uh, symbols on the plot actually is a potential interpretation of MSY, FMSY in a two-species system. Once you get a multi-species system, this gets even worse. Um, dynamic B0, I won't spend a lot of time on dynamic B0, but this is integral to um, uh, many of the tuner assessments. And I think Aaron Berger, who's on the call, can comment on that. They have been using dynamic B0 and dynamic BMSY for many years. Uh, and that involves projecting the um, population dynamics model after you fitted it to data, assuming there was no fishery. So basically that recruitment or recruitment deviations or growth deviations for that matter, uh, were going to be what you thought them to be. Um, and uh, what the tuna folks do often is producing plots like this, which essentially shows the impact of each fishery on biomass. Uh, so dynamic B0 in this case is the, the upper line here. So this is what would the biomass have been had there been no fishing. Um, so dynamic B0 has been used uh, in uh, many contexts. Uh, there's a recent paper by uh, Cecilia O'Leary and colleagues uh, that have compared uh, the moving window and the dynamic B0 um, methods for calculating reference points. I don't know if people have seen that. It came out this year. Um, and in this particular case, they found that uh, management decisions were quite robust to which solution, which method you chose, uh, but that dynamic B0 was a little bit more uh, stable. Um, and uh, if you're interested in that, read the paper. So um, I'm now going to touch, go, having seen all these options, uh, what, how do we choose them? Uh, I don't even remember where this slide comes from. This was the definition of management strategy evaluation. Um, I hope it's not hocus pocus. Um, I think it might have came out of the, I can't remember. Um, so uh, MSC has been used uh, in all the jurisdictions that are being represented on this call. Uh, the nice thing about MSC is that we can link uh, our operating model to um, 
uh, environmental processes uh, through uh, biophysical coupling. Um, that's been done, obviously, a lot in ecosystem models, uh, but we're starting to do it within the context of management strategy evaluation. And in particular, I'd like to point out the R-Path model that um, Sean Lucy and his, his colleagues have produced um, uh, that, that allows you to do MSC in, in the context of an EWE model. I'm not going to go through this slide. This is actually just a summary uh, of um, scenarios that have been included in uh, MSCs to date. Um, that includes changes in stock crucial relationships, natural mortality, carrying capacity, all sorts of things. So this is not new by any manner of means. I published this paper in 2016. The Whaling Commission have been worrying about this issue, um, the issue of time varying parameters. Uh, for, for literally decades, um, and it's integral to how we evaluate our management systems. Um, so just a quick slide on how one integrates um, uh, uh, climate models into these MSEs uh, as, as, um, as we've done in the North Pacific now. Um, so essentially, we usually have a number of climate models. Uh, we downscale them. Uh, we apply some model selection criteria to get rid of models that are unrealistic. So for those of us who work in the North Pacific, we're quite uh, in love with the PDO. Um, and so a climate model that doesn't have a PDO usually gets removed with usually lethal prejudice. Um, uh, and then we look at different emission scenarios and we integrate the climate uh, with, the, um, uh, with the population dynamics. And I'll be giving a talk tomorrow at 3 p.m. I think it is Pacific time. Uh, where we've done this for uh, Northern Rock Sol uh, in, the, in the North Pacific, uh, where we've linked uh, the climate models directly into the stock assessment models in the, in the form of an enhanced or extended stock assessment. Uh, just to emphasize um, that uh, when we're doing this kind of MSC work, uh, no model is correct. Um, and so I always advocate trying to use multiple models ranging from EWE models, MICE models, extended stock assessment models, um, Atlantis. Each of these models has its own uh, pros and cons. And the hope is that at the end of the day, we're uh, aiming to find a strategy that is robust to the uncertainties. So in the last five minutes, I want to cover um, essentially what have we learned so far. Uh, and we've learned quite a lot about time-varying parameters and time-varying reference points. Uh, this is from a paper, I think this is the 2014 paper that I wrote with uh, various colleagues. Um, nothing important about this slide except there's a lot of lines on it, um, indicating that quite a number of people have tested harvest control rules or management strategies when the operating model in includes environmental drivers of, of biological parameters. And some of those are trends, some of those are regimes, some of them are just uh, environmental variation, depending on the, uh, the application. So uh, what, have we, what have we learned? Uh, the first thing is um, we, we know that just because you've included environmental variation or time varying parameters or time varying reference points doesn't always mean that you will achieve your management goals better. So this is an example where you do. Number four here is a uh, a strategy, uh, this is Pacific Sardine, uh, that um, is uh, static. It has no link between SST and, and FMSY. And you can see it sitting down here in the lonely territory. This is uh, best performance is out here and out here. Um, plural number four really is what we call a dominated solution. Uh, constant F really not a, a, a viable strategy for this system. Um, the other thing, just to re-emphasize, is uh, the importance of multiple models, uh, multiple, in this case, IPCC models, to look at time-varying parameters. Um, so this is forecasts of uh, a reference point over time by uh, some work by Teresa Amar, one of my grad students now in New Zealand. Um, and you can see, uh, without going into all the different models, that the lines are quite different, depending on which particular climate model and which particular emission scenario you, you decide to select. Uh, just re-emphasizing the need for uh, multiple models. Um, so 
Uh, some conclusions about time varying parameters will depend on the operating model, so what's really going on. And, and this is just a summary of um, uh, the modeling systems we've developed for uh, Pacific sardine, which includes single species models, mice models, ecopath models, and in fact, an Atlantis model. So all of them, and they're all integrated together to, to try to get an understanding of, of dynamics. Um, one has to ask the question from a management point of view, uh, how do we change management? Uh, and the focus here of a paper by Laurie Kell uh, was comparing uh, strategies that change F versus B. Um, and personally, unsurprisingly, uh, Laurie and his colleagues found that uh, in a changing environment, uh, basing management on target F rather than target B was more, more robust. So we have learned a few things. Um, um, two, two points on essentially how much and is it important to um, take time varying parameters into account. Uh, generally speaking, and this is a paper by Jimmy Nelly, um, what we've found is the cost of uh, assuming time varying reference points uh, when uh, the system is, is stationary is less than the impact, or at least some of the impacts, of not allowing for re time varying reference points when the system is changing. So basically, um, type one or type two errors, depending on, on which one you, you want. Uh, the other thing about this uh, paper a long time ago from um, Jose Dolivera and Doug Butterworth, uh, who included uh, environmental variables and control rules and found that unless a pretty substantial proportion of the variance was explained, uh, you didn't really achieve uh, goals um, very successfully or much more successfully than ignoring it. So uh, we have to have our dragons and what are our dragons? Uh, the first one is the political dragon. So I won't read the whole quote. There's a paper by, um, by Edgar uh, commenting on that Jackass Morwan example I gave you earlier. Um, the Jackass Morwan, remember, led to a lower um, uh, BMSY um, and uh, the uh, commentators were not very happy about this, essentially because it meant that uh, what was a, um, a depleted stock and dropping pre pre precipitously, I love that word, um, meant it could be classified as sustainable. Um, and also criticized that particular work at that time as not linking essentially changes in model output to changes in biology. Um, I do want to raise the counter example. Uh, this is an example, this is not a real example, where our BMSY has increased. Um, and let's say you are going to the Minister of Fisheries, uh, and here is B current. Okay, So under the old BMSY, you were above BMSY, so you should be really happy about this, and you don't get in trouble. However, if BMSY has increased, you'll notice that we're now on the kink of the control rule. So we're actually gonna to have to reduce, and think about this, reduce the TAC because the stock is now more productive. Um, and that, I, I thankfully have not had to experience that myself, but I really don't wanna be the person explaining that to a decision maker. Good news, stock is more productive. Bad news is we need to be more conservative. Um, um, this paper, all of you uh, remember, um, Ram Myers, uh, from 1998. This is one of the classics in, in the field. Uh, this is the paper that looked at uh, old stock, I mean, environment recruitment relationships um, and, uh, you know, gave one out of 47 that had survived the uh, test of time. Um, so always remember that uh, what the data giveth, the data can take away. So I'm just about on my time, but I started a few minutes late. So I'm going to go through a couple of of recommendations uh, to take people forward. The first one is uh, invoking regime shifts in particular uh, on the fly is, a, uh, is something you should do with considerable care, even if that means that you don't have to go to lunch, you can change your, your reference points. Um, and this is a paper by Neil Clare from Australia uh, that was trying to come up with some uh, rubric, uh, a scoring rubric to essentially decide you know, is there sufficient evidence to evoke a regime shift? Um, and I won't go through the details, you can read the paper. Um, just to note that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence Atl Atlantic Cod got the highest number of points in this 
uh, particular comparison. Um, and Jack S. Moore Wong um, was the second worst uh, at seven points. You'll notice the um, last one down there is Gemfish. And at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that uh, I've been doing this for uh, 35 years. This was actually the first example that I worked on uh, where we invoked a regime shift. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, was six out of 10 good enough? So um, almost my last, my last thoughts here. Um, test before you adopt. Um, so it's great to have these rubrics and things, uh, but testing the consequences of um, making the right and wrong decisions uh, using MSC is definitely something that I would strongly advocate. Um, and, and have and, and learned a lot from doing so. Um, and then the other point, if you are going to do this work, uh, looking at several different models of how ecological processes affect um, systems. And the reason for that is that we don't want to choose our management system pinned to one particular interpretation of a data set. So think quite broadly about what our data are actually saying. Um, I'm not going to, I'll touch on that maybe in questions. It's more to do with plausibility. Um, but I want to conclude with going back to my original questions. Um, so what? Um, in my opinion, uh, we should consider changing biological and, and occasionally in, in the Australian system, economic reference points. Uh, that should be a standard part of the assessment management process. Um, now, note that passive adaptive management does this to some extent. So things like if you're calculating a reference point uh, and you need selectivity, you will usually take the last couple of years uh, of selectivity. And dare I say, we've been doing that since the days of EPA. So there's no real, uh, there's nothing controversial about changing reference points in principle. Uh, it's more a question of process. Um, why do we change them? Uh, well, most of the evidence suggests that um, the bias variance trade-off favors changing reference points over not changing them. So the loss due to additional variance uh, is tends to be less than the uh, improvement which can occur. And there are several studies that have, have looked at that. Uh, my favorites are the um, anchovy and sardine in South Africa by, um, by Karen Nabour and, and Doug Butterworth. Um, when should you do this? Um, uh, again, trying to avoid ad hocery, um, um, and in particular coming up with a, uh, a system a priori as part of your stock assessment terms of reference. Uh, on the West Coast, it's expected that assessment authors will report dynamic B0, although in our system we haven't used it. Um, so um, try to adopt before you are confronted with the uh, emotional uh, pain of having to defend a, uh, a ad hoc decision. And finally, uh, MSE to test uh, what you are looking at. And with that, I will stop. I'm four minutes late. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and we'll take questions.